everyone. Welcome to episode five of BCG's Health Tech Videos. I'm Arielle Rothman, and today's moderator is John Goldadder, Managing Director and Partner at BCG. I'm excited to introduce our two panelists who are here today to discuss AI and pharma. Jim Weatherall is VP of Data Science and Artificial Intelligence in R&D at AstraZeneca, and Nahid Kurji is President of Recursion Canada and formerly co-founder and CEO of Cyclica. Thank you both so much for joining, and I'll pass it off to John now to begin the discussion. Hey, Jim, Nahid, good to see both of you again. I'm really excited to have this chat today. Uh, appreciate you both making the time. Um, if, if it's all right, we're just going to jump in and I'm going to throw the first question um, to you, Nahid. Uh, Nahid, you know, you've been, in, you've been in this business for quite a while, um, as, a, as of you, Jim, and we've seen a, a ton of interest and advancements across the preclinical value chain from, from AI developments, um, areas from drug repurposing and candidate selection, and even into some novel molecular design. I, I'm wondering, in your, in, from your perspective, where you've really seen the, the big preclinical value developments to date, but also where you think they're going to come tomorrow and how it's going to develop? You know, the problems that a number of the early emerging companies in AI drug discovery were focused on solving, largely focused on chemistry, the discovery design of uh, new molecular entities with a focus on the small molecule modality. And that's just primarily because data was available for that. It was an easier value proposition. And there are already computational methods that were focused on that with a very different physics-based approach. Now, if you fast forward to today, there are hundreds of companies each developing and solving a different piece of a very complicated value chain of drug discovery. So you have where I'm really excited about is a lot of the work being done in genetics and genomics, leveraging that data, which has now become much more readily available to identify new plausible targets. You know, one of the challenges is then validation of those targets for disease. And I think there's a lot of effort going into that through classical means, as well as machine learning means to get to not only identify novel targets, but validating those targets. I th still believe in modality design discovery of new molecules, whether it be small molecules, proteins, peptides, oligos, or other modalities. And where I'm seeing a lot of focus right now, because I think it's the area that has not yet been adequately addressed, there's no meaningful real big technology that has solved this, is in preclinical toxicology or ADME, uh, especially on the toxicology side. Uh, I think data is just sparse. It's not as readily accessible. And so where I'm excited about the future is a lot more on not only discovering a molecule that interacts with a desirable target, but ensuring that it avoids undesirable targets, that it has the right polypharmacological profile. It's, it's fascinating, your, your, your thoughts there. Jim, interested in you, your thoughts as well. Thanks so much, John. And I think what we're seeing now in the preclinical space that's maybe a little different than a few years ago is scaled examples at almost every point on that chain, rather than uh, pilots or um, isolated pieces of technology. So in other words, right the way through the, the process of understanding disease biology, um, identifying uh, drug targets, um, identifying and then refining the design of those molecules, as Nahid um, touched on, and then going forward with those candidates. You know, so to give us some examples, we now use biomedical knowledge graphs with billions of data points to help us do very accurate um, AI based inference around different areas of disease biology, particularly for complex chronic diseases. Moving on to that step about um, molecular design that was also just, just touched on um, in the small molecule space, we're now um, using, I would say, AI-led um, molecular um, sort of cycles and design across probably three quarters of our, of our chemistry programs. So they're really now using the chemist as a sort of expert advisor and the AI through you know, techniques like um, uh, recurrent neural networks in a reinforcement learning paradigm to be able to optimize the scores of those molecules and get them to where you need them to be. And then in, in terms of, I guess, the, the mirror of that question, which I think the second half was, where am I excited about seeing it going next? I do see us on the sort of crest of a wave in terms of applying some of those AI-driven molecular design techniques more in the sort of antibodies, protein, and large molecule space. And, and the reason I'm particularly excited about that is there are opportunities there to combine not the AI with high throughput experimentation, which, which that field has not really seen before. Um, it's often a very low throughput exercise, very heavy in terms of um, human input. 
to tweak sequences and get those large molecules to the place we want them to be. Again, we're finding with a combination of AI and very high throughput um, instrumentation that we can probably reduce cycle times there by orders of magnitude and get uh, more accurate molecules. I find it fascinating, both of your points of view, and there's a, a significant amount of overlap in them. Jim, kind of coming to you first on, uh, on a follow-up, um, I want to talk a little bit about the speed and value gain. How far do you think this can go? And what, what's the real opportunity space and speed and, and value gain that, that you think you can get, both from a uh, preclinical perspective, but all, all, all the way into clinical development post IND? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, John, because I think speed is really of the essence. Uh, and, and just to be clear, this is speed with no no loss of quality. So it, it, it's a high bar, but we are seeing that promise from, from these types of techniques. So, you know, we just talked about some examples in the preclinical space where we're going to take maybe six months off our, um, uh, you know, um, uh, cycle times for small molecules and possibly years off our cycle times for, for large molecules. So that, that on its own is quite transformative. But if we accelerate that forward now into the, the clinical space, there's a whole area there of um, ongoing and upcoming developments that I think are going to help us um, even more. So having the data much more interconnected and having AI sort of acting proactively to do data adjudications in clinical trials is one example of something that could really um, accelerate that. We're also using a lot of imaging in, uh, in, in the clinical process to sort of understand heterogeneity of, of populations um, and, and understanding actually in a multimodal way, not just with imaging data, but with molecular and multi-omic and other types of data, understanding how to better segment populations to run more efficient, more effective, more selective trials. The reason being, you bring the right patients into those clinical trials. You bring the right pa the patients in who are most likely to benefit from the medicine, and you establish early efficacy of that medicine in the population who are likely to have the greatest benefit. Nahid, interested in, in thoughts you have on on, on the space, especially you mentioned um, that you think there's advancements needed further in um, toxicity prediction and ADME, and, and in that context, doing that right, I, I would I would almost guess that. Um, you might be thinking some elements of this could potentially disappear if we if we really get these models and capabilities developed to their highest extent. The problem statement in our space remains the same. Everybody's trying to solve the same problem. Can we design better medicines faster? I would add, can we design more better medicines faster? Is there a throughput opportunity to do so much more than we currently can, not just faster and equally, if not better quality, but much more at scale. And that industrial mentality, I think, is possible because of the advancements in both algorithmic development, like machine learning and deep learning and these new architectures, as well as compute from CPU to GPU, and now hopefully the wave of quantum computing starting to have meaningful impact down the road. So number one, I would just say industrialization, scale, and throughput, in addition to speed and quality. The other one is, you know, I believe that the future is through integration of a number of techniques and capabilities, both computationally driven and empirically experimentally driven. There has to be an interface with people, with experimental wet lab science, and with AI ML models in a harmonious way where there are predictions, there are validations, there is both positive and negative data. That data is now organized in a specific way that can come back into the models and train. And then you have human intuition to help point and direct things that the models right now just simply are not able to clean insights on or provide insights on. And I think that harmonious capability of bringing in different capabilities, both computational and empirical, is the future. The tech bio space is showing that its preclinical pipeline is increasingly a big wave. Now, how much of that is translating into the clinic? We're now starting to see many companies take solid preclinical data and bring that into the clinic in a fraction of the time, in quarters instead of years in months instead of years. And I think that's really exciting because it's only a 10 year old space. If that's possible now, imagine what's possible in the next five, 10 years. Yeah, and I, I appreciate both your comments. And I would say that we do think there's a huge bow wave of momentum in the industry. And, and I would agree with both of you in my very simplified language of more, better, faster, cheaper. Um, you know, I, I think we would all share that perspective. Um, as we wrap this up, just a quick question. The industry, 
is evolving in a way that even though we saw the emergence of computational chemistry and players like Schrodinger over the last couple of decades, it, it would be my contention that the industry is evolving at a pace and with a set of players playing in highly differentiated spaces is probably faster um, and to some extent even more exciting than, than historical from the, the largest pharmas to the most unique um, you know, biotech players focusing on small problems. Um, Nahid, is, let me start with you. How should pharma and the emergence of the newer players, the AI biotechs, whether they be, you know, plat whether they be, um, you know, platform and service providers, or whether they be asset developers, um, or whether they be an integrated mix of those things, how how should the industry be thinking differently about working together and, and partnering in this space to achieve more, better, faster, cheaper? Um, business model evolution has. Um, been top of mind for a number of companies for the past 10, 12 years on this side of the table, the innovator side of the table of building kind of this tech bio space. You had a lot of service-based companies build the technology, prove it out in pilot studies with pharma companies, bring in some cash, show the proof points on multiple streams, build case studies and a repertoire of examples that you can then show and build more business. I think what has my strong view is the service-based model for companies like Cyclica in the early days to pharma was just not a sustainable, was never going to be a, a value capturing business. But how do you then become a drug discovery company if you don't have a substantial capital base to be able to do that? I think there's a multi-pronged business model at play, probably three. One, especially on the back of the scale of the compute and the infrastructure is owning your own pipeline where you are in control of the destiny of those assets and be very strategic about that. Number two, collaborations with pharma companies where there are the upfront fees, milestone payments, the classical business model. And number three, increasingly is on a data side business model. With the amount of data that's coming in, are there business models that are compelling for both parties to say, that's really exciting, valuable data that we can use in non-competitive ways? And I think we're increasingly seeing those types of business models. The recursion, Roche, Genentech one is a really exciting example. And I think we're going to see many more of those. Okay, well, nicely put, Nahid, which hopefully saves me a bit of time because I see some of the same, right? I, I see this spectrum. So firstly, it's an ecosystem, right? Going forward, it's going to be an ecosystem. None of us will do this alone. We will need companies, small, medium, large, collaborations with academia. I believe in it all because I think they all contribute something unique and biology is a hard enough problem as it is. So we're probably gonna solve that problem together. In terms of that emerging biotech or tech bio space, I, I think you're right, Nahid. I mean, you know, I, I see a whole range of business models from companies that kind of own their own pipeline um, or don't and kind of want to partner or want to go it alone. Maybe the one piece I'll add is about what resonates or what works from, you know, sitting in a big pharma and what kind of helps us in terms of a collaboration. We're usually looking for that kind of uniqueness. And again, I think you touched on it. Is there data that's being generated that is an asset? Is there process or software or tools or something that are really interesting that actually would be kind of clunky and time consuming for a large company to develop? Is there something interesting in terms of assets in that pipeline? It's It sounds strange, but it's usually everything but the AI <laughs> because the AI and the modeling and the data science experience we have, what we don't have and what a lot of these small companies really excel at is one of those other things. Do they have unique data? Do they have unique products? Have they developed a really smart way of, you know, doing federated AI or something on data at different places around the world or anything that's kind of novel, different, and is kind of um, a large company often doesn't have the agility or is not able to go into, into depth on any one of these things. So uh, I think that that would be my answer, John, just to build a little bit um, on what Nahid said in terms of you know, putting the pharma lens on it and what it is about those business models that resonate with us versus perhaps not so much. Guys, it's fascinating to listen to both your points of view. Really appreciate your time today and uh, that you've given us to, to have this chat. 